I just wanted to introduce um, Reed Walker and Tama Carlton. So Reed's from UC Berkeley and Tama is from UC Santa Barbara. And they're going to be talking today uh, on the inequality of environmental damages as part of the um, Bread IGC PhD environmental economics course. There's a series of 10 lectures. Uh, and the only thing, I think the only operational things are if you want to kind of be put into the webinar, then please um, raise your hand and Caleb will elevate you into it. And you can also put questions in the chat and the Q&A, which we'll sift through and then have about 15 to 20 minutes at the end uh, to um, for the lecturers to answer questions. So Reid, I think you're going to go first. So take it away. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks for having me. So I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes uh, on uh, and introduce some of the topics and then Tim is going to take over and then we'll all kind of circle back for questions uh, at the end. Um, so I think, generally speaking, we're here to talk about issues of environmental inequality. And I think that could mean lots of different things to lots of different people. And so I thought I'd just talk a little bit about what I think about when I hear the words environmental inequality uh, from a research perspective. So you could imagine studying questions pertaining to inequality and exposure to environmental harms. Maybe you're interested in understanding whether or not certain groups in society are disproportionately exposed to say, higher levels of air pollution than other groups uh, and understanding the causes and consequences of those disparities. Uh, you might also be interested in the inequality and the effects of environmental harms. Maybe, for example, two people have the exact same exposure to an environmental harm like air pollution, but one person uh, is much more sensitive to air pollution than the other. That leads to a form of inequality and damages, uh, whereas one person uh, has relatively little impact of air pollution exposure on them, the other person has a very severe impact. You might also be interested in situations uh, where environmental policy, um, let's imagine we had some policy like the Clean Air Act uh, in the United States that changes the distribution of pollution exposure through mandated policy improvements, and that leads to unequal changes in air quality uh, in different parts of a country or a region. And you might as a researcher be interested in understanding the extent to which this particular policy led to differences in exposure or differences in uh, benefits or differences in harms uh, and think about tools and ways to measure those types of issues. So today I wanna just introduce this topic by talking and focusing on three main issues um, before passing the baton off to Tama. And the first issue is issues of measurement. And what I wanna emphasize here is that we are at a very unique period in uh, research on environmental inequality from a measurement perspective, because things that we just never could observe five to 10 years ago um, are now, we're able to see in almost real time um, through the advent of new measurement technologies that I'm gonna talk about. And so that's really exciting from a research and policy perspective. The second area that I'm gonna focus on is issues of valuation. Um, and what I mean by that is trying to understand how we use the economist's toolkit to try to understand how exposure to an environmental harm like air pollution or climate change, how do we think about valuing that exposure uh, in the context of valuing or quantifying the damages associated with, say, exposure to uh, changes in climate or exposure to deforestation or exposure to air pollution? How do we think about valuing those, um, those, those environmental externalities? Uh, and then the last, and I'll conclude, is talking about some examples of how one might go about in thinking about estimating in the impacts of things like climate change or air quality on the distribution of environmental exposures and environmental inequality more generally uh, before handing it off to Tama, who will speak much more about these issues. So 
I think in the U.S. and certainly globally, issues of environmental inequality have risen to prominence uh, in recent years. Um, and the modern day environmental justice movement in the United States has really catalyzed these efforts. And part of that is really a growing recognition uh, that there are huge differences and disparities or burdens that different groups in society face when it comes to environmental quality. And a lot of that comes about through advances in our knowledge that have come about through better measurement. And as I alluded to before, data and measurement has improved dramatically over the past 10 years. And I wanna just talk about a few examples of what that looks like. So in the US, uh, the US is one of the richest countries in the world. Uh, we have an environmental protection agency here that uh, is a, an agency that's designed to uh, enforce federal rules and regulations pertaining to clean air. And the EPA um, measures and monitors air quality in the United States. They measure air quality for lots of different pollutants. One of the pollutants that they're most concerned about is particulate matter, fine small particulates. This is air pollution that is harmful to breathe that leads to increases in mortality, uh, reduces life expectancy and other forms of uh, increased morbidities. And this is a map showing the EPA monitoring network for fine small particulates in the United States today. Uh, and what this is showing is different counties or regions in the United States that have a single air pollution monitor for fine small particulates. Those are the areas that are in the kind of colored red, pink, or white. And then you'll notice that there's a lot of gray areas in the United States. And these are areas where the Environmental Protection Agency has no monitor. They have no ability to measure fine small particulate in that region because they do not have a regulatory grade monitor in that area. So there are vast portions of the United States where the EPA does not have the ability to measure and monitor uh, fine small particulate pollution. And that's how things have been for the past 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, now, very recently, things have changed dramatically through the advent of satellite and remote sensing technology that allows us to connect air pollution measurements to satellite imagery and produce data products that look like this. So we go from uh, an area of very, very coarse um, and incomplete measurement and monitoring of particulate matter to a high resolution, spatially continuous data product that produces daily estimates of air quality on a one kilometer grid for the entire US, but also for the entire globe. And this is one example uh, of many of uh, the ways in which um, measurement and monitoring and advances have changed the game for researchers and policymakers in this space. And there's lots of other examples. This is another example from colleagues uh, here at Berkeley that were interested in measuring uh, global poverty um, around the world. And this is important for lots of different reasons. But the way that different measures of poverty uh, or wealth uh, had been collected historically is through surveys. Surveys are expensive to run. Uh, oftentimes, they're not run very frequently. Oftentimes, the agencies in charge of creating these survey data uh, release these statistics at a very aggregated level. Researchers are concerned, and some countries don't have the capacity to produce kind of high quality survey data. And so there's lots of holes in our understanding of global poverty um, as a result. And so what this team of researchers did was say, well, maybe we can do better uh, by combining some of the survey data with other things that we can measure through satellites like nighttime lights or through cell phone technology where we can monitor and measure where people are and how they move um, or through imagery around road networks and transportation. And we're going to use tools of machine learning to combine all of these inputs together and forecast and predict measures of global poverty at a very high resolution um, basis for over 100 low and middle income countries. And so you can imagine and see how valuable this type of information is for aid agencies, for researchers and others that are interested in measuring global poverty. Last example, in the context of climate change and climate change impacts, 
um, researchers in this literature are interested in understanding, well, what is going to happen in the context of future climate change? And, and generally speaking, they're interested in understanding different climate scenarios based on how aggressively we abate carbon emissions. So there are tools that researchers use called global climate models that allow us to, for different scenarios, predict and forecast what temperature precipitation will look like in some future time period. And historically, those GCMs produce output that is very coarse. Uh, and that's a problem if you're a researcher trying to understand the, for example, impacts or the inequality and in impacts of global climate change on society. Because you, you can see the kind of course measures in the upper left of this picture, these uh, big wide pixels, um, kind of smooth over a lot of differences compared to the bottom right corner. And so what researchers have been trying to do is to try to downscale these GCM models to have a more accurate representation, uh, more high resolution representation of what future climate change will look like in, um, in these areas. And that allows them then to connect those downscale predictions and forecast to, um, to various uh, socioeconomic data um, and try to do a better job in thinking about the impacts of future global climate change scenarios and um, uh, and try to learn a bit more about society, kind of the, the cost of future climate change, but also the ability for individuals to adapt and maybe change their climate. Okay, and there are lots of other examples. I just mentioned three, but there's new examples coming online every day we can measure global surface temperatures using satellite imagery. We can measure things like soil moisture. We can measure things like rainfall, uh, land use patterns like deforestation, or even different types of crop varieties using satellite imagery. And again, this is stuff that we weren't able to do even five to 10 years ago uh, because we didn't have the tools uh, to be able to measure and monitor these things in a globally comprehensive nature. Um, because it was too costly uh, to assemble. And so machine learning tools and remote sensing and satellite imagery have really changed the way that we can do research in this area. Last thing I'll say is that all of these things that we just pointed out and looked at, this picture, this picture, this picture, uh, these examples, these are all predictions or forecast that come from model-based estimates. Uh, and one needs to be careful when using these data products that these are forecast or predictions and they have their own sets of modeling uncertainty and prediction errors. And so we wouldn't necessarily want to take these tools off the shelf and plug them into, say, an econometric analysis without being careful about uh, the fact that there's some modeling uncertainty and forecast error in this data that we're using. Okay. So I think that that is important setting up the stage uh, for kind of what we can do with these types of data. And the first thing that I think is important and perhaps underemphasized in economics as a social science is just it's descriptive work. Um, because these examples that I'm kind of cycling through are situations where we were kind of once kind of like going through the jungle and couldn't really see very well. And then all of a sudden it's just like, we have like glasses and for the first time we can kind of see and look around in the world and what's going on. And I think it's really important to just start establishing some facts uh, with these data. And so I think there's lots of compelling descriptive papers to be written with new data like this to try to advance our understanding of key issues of environmental inequality, for example. And when we start doing high quality descriptive work of this sort, just using this data, it often generates all kinds of new questions and hypotheses about why such patterns exist. You start putting this data together and you look at maybe say trends in these new data products over time and you kind of start asking yourself like, well, why, did, why does that look that way? Um, or what features of society would generate this pattern or how could it look this way? And, and so what I'm getting at is that there's just from a research perspective, a lot of value in doing this descriptive work. Uh, there's social value, but it's also privately valuable for you as a researcher um, 
to start speculating and generating hypotheses as to why this uh, some of the things that you uncover in descriptive work exist. And I have a handful of papers I can point to uh, that started that way of just kind of poking around with descriptive work and trying to understand why these um, patterns and trends exist. Okay, so the second part I wanna talk about is how do we go from measurement these issues that we've been talking about to quantifying damages from an economics perspective. And so economists really spend a lot of time thinking about how differences in exposures translate into differences in well being or economic welfare. And the key tool for translating exposures of any type of non market good, goods that are not traded in marketplaces, goods that have no prices like air pollution or the value of forest or global climate change, carbon emissions. The key way in which we translate those differences in exposure into measures of welfare, well being, and damages is through what's known as the damage function. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about damage functions here and uh, in an abstract sense. And then Ken will talk about some more specific applications of damage functions. So in general, you could think about there being different damage functions for any type of environmental externality. So there's a damage function related to carbon emissions that tells us what are the social cost of those emissions on society, recognizing that when we emit carbon into the atmosphere, um, it uh, increases global mean temperatures, which then impacts society in various ways. And we can try to measure and quantify and aggregate all of this up into uh, a damage function. Similarly, for things like particulate matter, air pollution, there should be a damage function associated with that uh, to try to understand the ways in which me breathing or society breathing bad air uh, contributes to losses, economic losses, uh, reductions in well-being or, or economic welfare. Okay. So when we're thinking about a damage function in a very abstract and general level, you can think about a, a function, just some arbitrary function that we as society or as researchers want to learn about. And that function consists of two essential inputs. Really, uh, you could think about some function that translates different exposures. And here we're going to label exposures with an E. Um, we're going to translate the exposures into damages. So the other key component in damage functions is just trying to understand why people might have different damages for a given level of exposure. So uh, we're going to label this as differences in vulnerability and this, think of this as a vector of X's of different modifiers and the ways in which exposures can translate into damages. And that's really abstract sounding. So let me just talk about an example. Let's imagine, for example, uh, that I'm interested in understanding the damage function associated with, say, global climate change. And you can imagine that there's some people out there that are exposed to extreme temperatures, uh, really, really hot temperatures, and that really affects uh, things like uh, cognition, labor productivity, uh, mortality. Uh, and so there's a lot of people out there exposed to extremely high temperatures. Some of those people have access to air conditioning. The people that have access to air conditioning, that's a modifier. Uh, it reduces their vulnerability to global climate change. And it should be a key feature or input into the damage function in terms of thinking about the overall cost or um, uh, of damages associated with climate emissions. Namely, it affects how exposure uh, translates into damages. But we also need to recognize that when we're spending money on air conditioning, those are economic costs that we are uh, bearing society. And we need to think about ways to value those costs as well as any direct cost associated with extreme temperatures. Okay, that's again abstract. We're gonna talk about some more examples here uh, as we go on. Okay, so the key way in which economists translate differences in exposure into measures of economic well-being is through this damage function. And you could think in a very kind of loose two-dimensional sense, uh, a mapping of exposure here on the x-axis to damages on the y-axis. And the damage function here in green is just this function that translates 
exposure for population one into a measure of aggregate damages for population one, or exposure for population two into a measure of uh, damages for population two. Okay, and so a lot of effort from social scientists and, and economists uh, more specifically is spent trying to understand this F, this function, what does it look like? Um, what does it look like for different environmental externalities? And how do we go about delivering credible estimates as to what that damage function looks like? And that's a pretty hard thing to do um, from the standpoint of doing causal inference. There's lots of confounding omitted variables out there when we're thinking about uh, trying to understand the impact of say air pollution on mortality or extreme temperatures on agricultural yields, so on and so forth. Okay, um, so when we're thinking about these damage functions, we want to understand what the shape of that damage function is. We also want to know why some people may be responding differently to different levels of exposure, why those people have different vulnerabilities, if you want to uh, use that terminology, um, because the source of this heterogeneity or these differences in damages for different groups is something that we want to know First, just from like uh, a scientific perspective, we wanna know what are some of the underlying causes of differences in damages for different groups. But also from evaluation perspective, we wanna kind of know why different groups may be um, more or less vulnerable to a given level of exposure. Um, so in the context of thinking about like air pollution and air quality, um, you know, if I am an individual uh, and it's very smoky outside, air quality is very, very poor, maybe I choose to wear a mask all day to kind of reduce my um, vulnerability to extreme levels of air pollution. Wearing a mask to me is costly. You know, it kind of gets sweat in my mouth. I can't really talk or see people's voices. I have to pay for that mask. Uh, and these are costly actions that in kind of an abstract sense, displaced consumption of utility generating good. And these costs should factor into a damage function. So whenever we're thinking about differences in vulnerability, we will kind of want to understand what are the key underlying drivers of differences in vulnerability. Um, and uh, that's an important input. So I think there's another strand of this literature and that's trying to under identify the key sources of heterogeneity and damages. And ultimately what that comes down to is do these damages differ because of differences in vulnerability of the sort we've just described or because of some differences in the shape of the damage function or non-linearities in a damage function. And so let me just show you visually what that looks like. This is showing you two completely different scenarios uh, that in the data would look very, very similar to one another. So this is on the left showing you a non-linear damage function where we have population one and population two. Uh, population one is exposed to less of uh, the environmental externality than population two. They correspondingly have lower total damages than population one. Um, and you'll also notice that when we think about the slope or the tangency at this given point, which you might refer to as the marginal damage, that marginal damage here is lower for population one than it is for population two but they are all in the same damage function. Now over here on the right side of the graph, you'll notice that population one and population two have the exact same exposures as before. Um, and the marginal damages uh, are the same as before, but these are two different populations that have two entirely different damage functions. The population one has a damage function given in blue and population two has a damage function given in orange. And so from a research perspective, it's important to understand, do we live in the world over here uh, where the damage heterogeneity comes from a nonlinear damage function? Or do we live in the world over here where we have different damage functions for different sorts of groups? And this could be a result of maybe population two installing our population one installing air filtration in all of their houses or something that reduces their vulnerability and gives them a correspondingly 
uh, completely different damage function than this orange population. And those distinctions and differences are important from an evaluation perspective. Okay. Uh, fundamentally, these are causal questions that we need to be very clear about trying to identify the root underlying causes of treatment effect heterogeneity. And that's a hard thing to do in practice because we need to try to think about research designs where we have kind of experimental variation in the environmental harm um, and experimental variation in some type of modifier, uh, say like air conditioning or mask wearing or other things to try to understand the true nature of whether or not this treatment effect heterogeneity is causally related to this modifier or whether or not it's, uh, it's potentially correlated, but there's some other explanations lurking around in the background. Okay. Last thing I want to talk about uh, very briefly is just how different environmental policies um, may change exposure um, and how those exposures may differ for different groups and how we might go about measuring and quantifying those differences. So you could think about in a loose sense of policy, changing exposure and producing some benefit that is uh, equal to the differences and damages uh, from the pre-period to the post-period. And you can imagine that these policies, maybe it's, say, the Clean Air Act in the United States or some environmental policy in an area where you live, these policies can generate different changes in exposure for different groups. That's important to know and understand and try to estimate. Um, but it's also the case that these damages may differ across these groups as well, even if all of the exposure changes were uniform. And so both of these scenarios would lead to potentially unequal benefits associated with these policies that we could try to monitor, measure, and estimate using statistical techniques and tools. So the two ways that people go about doing this um, and thinking about how policy would affect exposure and ultimately lead to differences in benefits in society would be um, to use simulation forecasting uh, methods to try to say, for example, and this is often done in the literature and climate impacts, we want to simulate or forecast some future world that looks different than the world today based on the scientific evidence of what increases of global mean, uh, in greenhouse gas concentrations will then subsequently lead to differences in future temperatures, precipitation, cyclone activity, so on and so forth. So we're going to use simulation and forecasting to predict what the world will look like in some future time period. Uh, and then we're going to use our inferences about damages and the damage function to try to then quantify, well, in that state of the world, in some future state of the world, we would expect damages to be higher in this region and lower in this region, so on and so forth. So that's kind of prospective policy evaluation, if you will. Um, and then the other, it would be retrospective evaluation of trying to look in the past, use data and historical experiences, uh, past policies or past experiences to try to understand issues of environmental inequality or to try to calibrate or quantify what does the damage function look like for say uh, exposure to extreme temperatures on mortality or on agricultural yields or on labor productivity. And so that's using historical data to try to um, estimate and quantify differences in, uh, in damages across groups. Uh, and that's another strategy that people use in this literature. Okay. Um, Last thing I want to say is just kind of point to one paper that really speaks to the, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this paper, but it's really a paper that's both about measurement and thinking about how policy leads to disparate impacts of environmental quality for different groups in society. And this is a paper that I worked on um, with Janet Curry and John Voorhees. And what we were interested in doing was trying to use some of this new data to try to deliver some descriptive facts on environmental quality and differences in environmental quality for different groups in society. Um, and so the first part of this paper is just descriptive and just saying, look, this is average particulate exposure for African-Americans over time. 
This is average particulate exposure for uh, non-Hispanic white individuals over time. And what you'll notice is that these two lines are, are kind of converging to one another over time. And that led us to kind of wonder like, well, why are those lines getting closer? Like, what are the key levers that is leading to this uh, relative improvement in environmental outcomes between these two groups? And you could speculate about a bunch of different hypotheses, but one thing that we kind of clued in on and, and spent more time thinking about was the issues of environmental regulation in the United States and how those disproportionately impact different groups in society based on where they live. Namely, the Clean Air Act really affects the very most polluted places, and the most polluted places are overly represented in terms of African-American population shares. And so when we kind of go through the exercise of trying to understand the impact of the Clean Air Act on uh, these communities, we can then come through a decomposition and try to quantify the overall effect of a policy on its contribution to reducing environmental inequality between different groups. Uh, and we showed that the US Clean Air Act led to about a 60%, led, contributed to about 60% of the gain uh, are the relative improvements between these two groups. So that's just one example. It's nothing fancy. We're not talking about damages or quantification. It's really an example of like, let's put some new facts out there and let's try to understand what, uh, why these facts exist and what's been leading to these relative improvements between these two different sorts of groups. So with that, I wanna hand it off to Tama and give her the floor to talk a little bit more about these issues in the context of global climate change. Great, thank you. Let me get my screen. Great. Seeing the screen? Okay. Um, thanks so much, Reed. I think basically the way to think about what I'm going to do for the next 30 minutes um, is talk through examples and methods of how you build these damage functions for climate change, but particularly thinking about why damage functions might differ across different populations and the importance of characterizing those local level differences in damage functions if you care about an accurate assessment of the une unequal damages of climate change. Um, okay, so when we think about climate change, we all have this general sense that this is a global scale problem. When I drive my car and emit more CO2, that is very rapidly mixed in the global atmosphere, meaning that I change climate change everywhere in the world when I drive my car. But of course, no one in the world experiences global mean surface temperature or global mean sea level rise. The way that we are experiencing this global scale process is in the form of weather events that happen locally, often extreme weather events. So the picture that you're seeing on the slide is a very good example of this from the floods in Pakistan last year that covered over a third of the country in water. But what we want to think about in, in sort of the context of unequal environmental damages is how the nature of this global scale problem manifests very differently in different parts of the world. So the same global scale process of climate change while Pakistan was experiencing these floods last summer was leading to a heat wave in the Southwestern United States. And the way that that the human welfare implications of that same global process look very different across these two contexts. There was extreme heat in the Southwestern United States, but you know the idea from these two pictures is that the human toll of this is very different. Now, being able to accurately characterize these local level damages is important, you know, if we, we just care about descriptively understanding them, like Reed was talking about, but it also matters for forming um, evidence-based policy. So on the mitigation side, a lot of our attempts of building um, national or international climate policy come from economic assessments of how damaging climate change will be overall. But even if we're interested in a global scale overall estimate of climate damages, we're going to get that number wrong if we assume that a heat wave in Mumbai has the same effect as a heat wave in Tampa, Florida. So getting that aggregate number uh, right does also require understanding local level impacts. And then, of course, on the adaptation side, if we're thinking about building local level policies to inform adaptation, we're going to need to try to characterize local level projected damages and think about both that differential exposure that Reed was talking about and differential vulnerability so that people can plan and respond uh, for what's coming in the future. So until 
somewhat recently, we had pictures of climate damages that looked like this. Um, this is one aggregate estimate of global climate damages coming from Bill Nordhaus's Nobel Prize winning model. This is an incredibly influential um, modeling attempt to bring the climate into the, a model of the global economy, very influential in forming early climate policy. Um, but what this doesn't allow us to do is to think about these inequalities and sort of characterize and describe the unequal damages of climate change. So just like Reed was showing you a, a map of you know, incomplete monitoring overlaid with satellite data, the idea behind sort of the rest of my talk is how can we take climate change projections that used to look like this and make them look more like this? How can we characterize local level damages and understand how unequal these damages might be? Now, I'm going to talk about the ways that we're doing this um, on the empiric side, so how we're building estimates like this from a data forward perspective. There's also a parallel literature that's making a lot of inroads into characterizing these inequalities from a very different approach using spatial equilibrium models. And so I think I don't have time to talk about both, but I think it's really important to note that both on sort of the data driven side, but also on the more structural modeling side, we're getting windows into unequal climate change damages at global scale. Um, and that's, you know, helping us both descriptively assess this problem, but also uh, inform policy. So what I'm going to do is talk through how we build um, these estimates again in a data forward way, building right off of what Reed was talking about. So basically, we're thinking about differential exposure, differential vulnerability, and building damage functions. So essentially, the problem that we're interested in is what happens in a society or an economy as the climate moves from, say, one probability distribution here in blue to another one um, in pink. As I said before, no one actually experiences the climate. The climate is this idea of a probability distribution of what you might experience in any given day. What we see in the data are actual time series of weather events for a given location. So think about in blue being some observed historical time series of weather. Our job as applied economists is to do is to basically spend a lot of time and energy recovering what's here in panel C. I'm going to call this a dose response function. I realize there's like lots of uh, different uh, ways of calling these things. You can think about this as a damage function if you would like. Same idea here. We're interested in how does some social or economic outcome we care about vary with a climate variable uh, that we can observe in the data? And our job is going to be to recover, say, this blue curve linking climate variable to social economic outcome. But of course, we're interested in long run climate change. So two different things happen when climate moves from that blue PDF to the pink one. We get this new realization of weather events in a given place. In this case, I'm shifting that climate variable to the right. Maybe this is daily average temperature and it's getting hotter. And when we get to our dose response function that we could have estimated empirically in the data, two things are gonna happen. One, we're going to get realizations that are farther along on this x-axis leading to say higher predicted levels of our social outcome. Say this is mortality risk, for example. But we also need to think about differential vulnerability, as Reed was highlighting. So under this warmer climate, I may now expect to see those hot days more frequently. I may invest in air conditioning. I may change the hours that I work, many different behaviors and technologies that also could change my curve from the blue curve to the pink curve. So essentially, our job is going to be recover these curves, ensure that we are allowing for possible nonlinearities, but also try to think about how we can build curves that, that uh, vary across different populations and time, capturing the fact that differential vulnerability could be an important part of the inequality uh, question. Once you've built panel C, so most of the rest of the talks be like, how do I build estimates of panel C? Um, then you can use climate models that tell you, you know, what will the future look like under different climates? Um, estimate predictions through panel C to, to generate projections of what might the future look like under different possible climate change um, on, in different communities around the world. Um, so I'm going to go through this for a few examples of, of outcomes that come out of collaborative work at the Climate Impact Lab, where we're trying to build these estimates for many different sectors um, at global scale. I don't, I'm not going to go into all these papers in detail, but I'm going to make sure the sites are here for you all um, if you want to look at them. And we're going to get sort of a window into how you do this for different types of outcomes around the world. And as you can imagine, characterizing inequality and characterizing these damage functions look pretty different for these different outcomes. So... Stepping back, if you are interested in like, I want to estimate unequal climate damages in some sector of the economy or some outcome of interest, broadly speaking, these are the three steps that you would walk through. So if you're you know, in, in the land of empirically based estimates, we're gonna start with data collection, 
Step two is basically all the stuff that goes into that panel C. How do we estimate these damage functions or dose response functions, accounting for differential exposure and vulnerability? And then in step three is basically an elaborate dot product where you're taking a climate model with your estimated dose response function and saying, what might the future look like? So starting with data, you know, I, I know you guys are um, probably interested in data sets and we'll send lots of links around. I think the one thing I want to highlight when I look through a few of our attempts to do this at global scale is that there's a lot of trade-offs in comprehensiveness and spatial granularity. And depending on the problem that you're interested in and maybe how much you care about local level variability and local level inequality, your choices in this uh, might look different. So for example, when we're working in energy, we're interested here in how consumption of electricity and, and other heating fuels varies with the climate. Um, we've got very nice comprehensive data across the world here, but it's very coarse resolution at national scale. You often face this trade-off where in the case of say mortality, we decided to go with local level resolution here, but then we're trading off spatial comprehensiveness. And so hopefully I'll have time to talk about this, but of course there's some really important data gaps um, in the data we've collected for mortality um, that definitely affect our ability to characterize, um, accurately characterize um, inequality uh, around the world. So for mortality, we're looking at mortality risk with temperature using subnational mortality records. In agriculture, we're looking at staple crops around the world and how those crop yields are responding to temperature and precipitation and other climate variables. Again, there's some really important data gaps here. For labor, we're looking at how people's work time has to adjust as the climate gets more extreme. So workers who are in exposed industries outside, are they able to work uh, their normal amount as the temperatures uh, rise and get warmer? And then on a coastal side, we're thinking about coastal assets and lives and properties that are at risk from rising sea levels and, um, and extreme um, events. And um, these were data that we had to sort of hand construct and they're all publicly available. I'm happy to send out links if anyone has a hard time finding them. Lots of other data sets I'm listing here, citations are here for you guys, but um, what's exciting kind of building off of what Reed said is that if you can get the data that you want on the social outcome side, potentially informed by new things like remote sensing, but potentially just normal administrative data, we've got so many more um, climate data sets available now that allow you to characterize and bring in the climate side um, at a high resolution relative to the uh, administrative data. Okay. So let's talk about how we build these damage functions, particularly in the case of climate change, accounting for both, you know, well, I'll bring Reed's graph back up, but both that nonlinear graph Reed showed and the fact that you may have two populations that actually have completely different damage functions or dose response functions. Okay, so to put Reed's sort of overall framework in the context of climate change, what we're thinking about here is how damages from climate change are going to occur in a given place based on the exposure that actually is realized there. So for example, how many hot days are hitting this particular community, but also how vulnerable that community is to that particular event. So for example, if E, we're thinking about E being hot days, you could imagine X um, being, including things like whether or not you have access to air conditioning. And when we, what we care about here is how can we characterize how global scale climate change leads to locally differentiated impacts we want to be able to account for differential exposure. So that Pakistan and Southwestern United States example, the Southwestern US is not getting the same exposure as Pakistan is despite this process of, of global scale climate change. We want to be able to account for possible nonlinearities. So we wanna be estimating functions that allow for the potential for there to be nonlinear results, uh, nonlinear responses, sorry. Um, but then we also wanna make sure we're allowing, looking in the data for evidence of differential vulnerability as well. So what I'm going to show in the next few slides is our attempts to build models that account for or allow for both of these features to be present when looking at how an outcome responds to climate. So let's start with the nonlinear piece. We're going to build um, econometric models that es essentially isolate random variation in the weather to identify flexibly a relationship between, say, temperature and precipitation exposure and an outcome you're interested in, for example, a mortality rate. The way we do this sort of econometrically is looking at, um, you know, local level weather, but then controlling for a suite of spatial fixed effects and temporal fixed effects that allow you to isolate variation over time in weather in a given population. So we're thinking about how Mumbai's mortality rate changes under a slightly hotter summer as compared to a slightly cooler summer, not comparing Mumbai's summer mortality rate to mortality in Chicago. 
Um, there's some really great reviews of this literature that are um, on the bottom of the slide where you can get sort of a deeper window into these econometric models and, and what people have learned from estimating them. So this gives us an, uh, essentially an estimate of this nonlinear damage function. For example, we're seeing that this older population in our sample um, has increased mortality risk, risk, both under extreme heat and under extreme cold. What this doesn't do is allow for that second part of Reed's graph, where potentially there's differential vulnerability. So to investigate the possibility of differential vulnerability, we're going to slightly broaden this model out to allow for the sensitivity to exposure, which you can think about collapsing into just one parameter beta. Imagine that beta represents how sensitive your outcome is to a particular weather event. We want to allow this model to characterize that that beta may itself depend on a bunch of conditions. So these are basically Reed's X's. And what these X's are are going to look very different in a different place, but also for a different um, outcome of interest. So for example, when we're thinking about mortality risk, it may be that your income is important in facilitating your investment in, uh, in air conditioning. If you're wealthy enough to afford an AC, you might buy one, whereas you may not otherwise. Your climate may also be important. So I'm here in Santa Barbara. I could buy an air conditioner if I wanted to. I rarely get to a temperature where I need it, so I don't have an air conditioner at home. But what these vector of, of um, covariates determining vulnerability look like will differ substantially across the different um, outcomes that we're interested in. So for example, irrigation is going to be very important in agriculture, less important uh, when we're thinking about mortality. Again, there's a lot of um, exciting literature, like doing the same type of thing here, where you can get a window into what this looks like in, in other papers as well. And those are on the bottom of the slide. So visually, what does this look like? Um, essentially, the idea here is let's use variation in vulnerability that we can see in the historic data to think about the drivers of vulnerability that may be important in the future. So what this means is that what we can see in the data, if we go to the coldest regions of the world, you're seeing on the right, the marginal effect of a very hot day. That death rate of over 15 deaths per 100,000 for the 65 plus population is an extremely large increase in the death rate for one hot day. This is like, I think auto fatality rates in the US are like 12 deaths per 100,000. But what we see in the data is that the people that are more adapted to these hot days, they have hotter and hotter climates, we see on the right this marginal effect decline. This is reflecting differential vulnerability of the population based on their climate conditions. So by the time we get to the hottest regions of the world, these are populations that experience 35C very frequently. On average, we tend to see much more muted response, reflecting higher um, adaptive capacity to this weather event. Um, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time, so I'm worried about getting stuff through. So moving um, on from mortality, I want to give you a window into how these types of models of nonlinearity and differential vulnerability look different in different sectors of the economy. So when we're looking at electricity, as you might imagine, we see in wealthy economies that um, there's this highly nonlinear curve. So electricity expenditures increase when people try, when people use electricity to cool on very hot days, but they also increase when people use electricity to heat on very cold days. This had been sort of a well-known curve estimated in many prior papers in like the US and the EU. But what we're showing um, in our data that's more globally comprehensive is that this curve looks very different around the world. So for the vast majority of the global population, people are simply too poor to use energy services to respond to heat or cold events. So we're seeing no response at all in electricity consumption in most of the global population. This is going to be really important in accurately characterizing local level vulnerability to climate exposure, as you can see how different these, these populations are today, but particularly when we start thinking about the future and these populations get wealthier and move towards the right, changing the shape of that damage function going forward. In the case of, of labor, what we see in the data is um, a pretty sort of a different angle on vulnerability. So um, I'm happy to point you to papers where we do sort of the sort of a variety of tests to think through how do we uncover the key drivers of vulnerability. But what we're seeing in our work and has been shown in um, in prior work, like by jo Josh Graf Zivin, for example, is that what really determines vulnerability in labor in the labor sector is where are you working. So for those of us that are working inside and in largely insulated environments, how much we work on a given day is really not affected by daily temperature. In contrast, if we go to workers who are in agriculture or mining or construction, we see this really steep drop off in the amount of time that they're actually able to work when temperatures, whoa, sorry, temperatures get really extreme. So in this case, we're seeing sector of employment uh, determining differential shapes of that damage function. 
in agriculture, I think there were some questions in the Q&A about agriculture. I would say like a lot of the literature on building these damage functions in economics with respect to climate change has come out of the agriculture sector. So there's just so much work in this space, identifying different weather variables that matter, different drivers of vulnerability that might matter. So our approach here was to build more of a machine learning um, uh, model to try to isolate the weather events and the vulnerability drivers that best predict variation in the outcome. So this kind of goes back to Reed's slide about like, how do you reliably pull apart what is nonlinearity and what is differential vulnerability? I would say, um, all of these papers are doing that imperfectly and they're doing it in different ways. So here, this is about using machine learning to try to solve that problem. All of those prior estimates, I'd say, are really correlational. So we're not at all yet at the point of getting um, experimental variation in the drivers of vulnerability. Um, Okay, so what this allows us to do, particularly, you know, in any of the sectors, but particularly in agriculture, we have this really rich space of different weather variables matter and a variety of different drivers of vulnerability matter. We're building local level damage functions at a very high resolution that reveal very interesting patterns of inequality. So, for example, if we look up here in like the Corn Belt of the United States, we know on average we're getting very high corn yields, but we see really extreme sensitivity to heat. In contrast, in Brazil, this is a place that is um, relatively poor compared to the, the Corn Belt, but we see much more muted response to, so responses to heat. So in general, this is just points you towards some of the answers about inequality and climate change damages can look very different for di different sectors of the economy, where we actually see some of the poorest regions of the world are the best insulated in terms of their responses of crop yields to, to heat events. Okay, so the last step in this process, basically you can think that at this point, you've built an econometric model of that panel C and that blue and pink graph I showed before. Now all we wanna do is take simulations of future climate change and say, what happens to different populations around the world as climate change unfolds, accounting for these nonlinear responses, but also the fact that there's differential vulnerability, different shaped damage functions in different places. In, um, in order to do this at, um, at high resolution around the world, it's important not just to think about the whole world warming consistently, but again, to accurately characterize differential exposure to the global process of climate change. So what you, you know, have at your disposal, just like satellite-based measures of air pollution, now are climate models that resolve local level changes in, in uh, warming, but differentially across different models. So what this graph is showing you is sort of different, sorry, different climate models predicting different magnitudes of warming on the x-axis. But if you look vertically, they also have different spatial um, uh, distributions of that warming. And so there's uncertainty both in like how hot we will get in the future, but also the spatial distribution of that warming across the world. And we want to be able to characterize the different possible futures that may unfold both along the x-axis, but also vertically in terms of who's facing that heat. In generating these predictions, we want to then, so this gives you your differential exposure. We wanna make sure we're capturing also differential vulnerability, basically those different response functions. So to make that concrete, here's an example. These econometric models we've built estimate a damage function for mortality in, in Oslo, Norway, that looks like this. We're seeing you know extreme increase, pretty extreme increases in uh, death, ri death risks under cold temperatures. It never gets all that hot in, in Norway, but some elevated um, death risk under heat as well. What does climate change on the exposure side mean for Oslo, Norway? Basically, it's taking a bunch of extreme cold days and making them a little bit more moderate. As you can imagine, that means we're kind of marching down this damage function, actually avoiding cold day deaths in Norway. That story looks very different in Accra, where we see largely because of the low income relative to the global population, very extreme responses to heat and a future climate that basically takes a bunch of moderate days and moves them into really extreme heat and therefore elevates mortality substantially. The idea here is that we, if we used a global average estimate of what sense of what vulnerability looks like and maybe a global average distribution of temperature change, we would really mischaracterize what local level um, and therefore um, inequality of damages looks like uh, around the world. I realize I'm running short on time. I think I can do it in four minutes. So. Um, Okay, so what, do we, what happens when we do this? As you might imagine, you uh, we generate estimates that, that reveal substantial amounts of inequality around the world. Again, both driven by differential exposure, but also by differential vulnerability to these events. 
So this is a map of projected mortality risks from climate change in 2100 under a very aggressive emission scenario. And you can see in general that the lion's share of this mortality burden is being borne by the global poor. To make that a little bit more concrete, here you can see that in low income, in the lowest income tercile of, of the population today, these effects are um, over 100 deaths per 100,000. So I think at the like peak COVID pandemic, um, we were looking at deaths, death rates in like some of the worst countries around the world are like 300 to 400 deaths per 100,000. So this is really large. You can think about it roughly as like a third uh, to a quarter of, of what COVID was doing at its peak. And that's dramatically different in middle and high income countries. On net, we're seeing the highest income countries actually are, um, are saving lives. I don't have time to get into it uh, today, but if you're interested, um, the citations are there to think about adaptation costs. It's really important when we're thinking about inequality to not just characterize these direct effects, but also to think about who's spending money on protecting themselves. That is also a part of the damages from climate change. And there's been some work trying to characterize what those um, adaptation costs look like as well. So this story of inequality, it looks a little bit different across different sectors of the economy, but there's a lot of similarities in, in these patterns. So in general, particularly if we look about, think about um, protection against uh, hot days through expenditures on electricity and the labor supply, these three stories are largely about today's global poor being most affected. Agriculture is a little bit different as I'll unpack um, in a moment. So um, in a lot of sectors, we see this sort of clear story that the lower income populations, particularly those that are in hot places, are bearing most of the burden. But in agriculture, we actually see that most of these effects are coming in what we call like the global bread baskets of the world. So they're actually wealthier uh, countries that are more temperate. Whereas in the labor sector, this pattern is even more severe than in um, than in mortality, where we see a lot the lion's share of the impacts on on workers are coming in the global poor, uh, the global poorest places as well as um, the hottest places in the world. Okay, I'm going to skip through some of this really quickly. I want to give you a window into. Um, how you can take these local level damage estimates and make them relevant for global scale climate policy. So I tried to convince you at the beginning that we care about characterizing local level climate damages for descriptive reasons and maybe for adaptation reasons, but we also um, can get aggregate numbers of damages wrong if we fail to characterize inequality. And so in doing that, I'm gonna talk really briefly about the social cost of carbon. This is a metric that is critically important to informing climate policy in the US and a handful of countries around the world. The idea is this is basically the monetary, monetary value of all the damages caused when you release one additional ton of CO2. This is really important because it allows policymakers to say, OK, how costly is it going to be to tackle the climate change problem? How much are we going to have to spend to lower emissions? and then to hold that up right next to an estimate of how many damages will that save us. So avoided damages on the one hand in dollar form can be held up against costs of achieving that mitigation on the, on the other hand. And this is becoming an increasingly more important metric. Just um, very recently in the United States, changes have been made such that the SEC is sort of infiltrating throughout many areas of government to help shape how governments are making decisions about emissions mitigation, like choosing emissions mitigation uh, or not. Um, the idea here is, is a social cost of carbon is about the damages from one more ton of CO2. So we're going to inject a ton of CO2 into the atmosphere. That's going to last for a long time, lead to a long, long tail of, of temperature change and ultimately um, damages from climate change. This last panel is basically built from all those damage functions that, that we talked about before. The critical thing for inequality is that we can build estimates of aggregate damages that account for the fact that a dollar of damage is worth a very different amount to a poor person than it is to a wealthy person. I'm not going to get into the details here, but you can think about this essentially as the same math behind a certainty equivalent calculation for risk being applied to income distributions. And these two different damage functions show you that once we account for that on the right, the damages that we estimate relative to consumption become much larger when you account for the fact that when a dollar of damage hits a poor person, it matters a lot more to their welfare than to a wealthy person. And when we bring that into these aggregate measures of social cost of carbon, by comparing this column three to column one, you can see that what, implementing this, which often is referred to as equity weighting, can really transform our estimates of aggregate damages uh, from climate change around the world just for appropriately accounting for how unequally those damages are shared around the world. 
Okay. Um, I've got a bunch of other slides. I'm going to blame Reed for being a little bit over because he didn't give me uh, my full th uh, 30 minutes. But basically, these slides, I think, are going to be distributed to, guide to you guys. I just want to give you a little bit of a guide to what is in here so that you can look at them later. Um, what's in the rest of the deck is thinking through some challenges and how you can, how we account for inequality and local level damages when trying to build estimates of things like the social cost of carbon. There's some like unique challenges that arise with respect to valuation, with respect to feedbacks and interactions, and with respect to migration that I think are important to have in mind if you're interested in working in this space and want to think about sort of the unknowns um, and what, what we're still really working on. Um, and then finally, the last few slides are really practical set of tools. So these are like computational tools that I think if you want to work in this space, there's like huge returns to, for example, being able to work with spatial data, being able to do spatiotemporal aggregation, um, working with remote sensing data. And then this is a really helpful, like very step-by-step -step tutorial. If you want to estimate a climate damage function, accounting for differential vulnerability or not, this is a really nice tutorial that will walk you through the data side, the econometric side, um, all the way through to the projection side. Great. Thanks. Sorry for going over a little bit. Thank you very much, Reed and uh, Tama. So I think we're going to open the floor now. Is that right, Caleb? Yeah, that's right. There's a few questions that we'll start with in the chat. And then any of the live participants, if you have questions, you can uh, raise your hand and we'll switch to you next. Um, also like to recognize Sandy Thum, who is a PhD student working on uh, these topics that will be helping out with the Q&A today. So thanks, Sandy. Um, I think we'll start with Sam Mugume's question. He had a question first around the definition of local damages, specifically local. Is that country, regional? Um, he just would like to hear your thoughts on that. And then secondly, if uh, what if one decided to look at damages depending on the level of economic development or main drivers of survival or growth, i.e. agriculture, industry, services, mining, et cetera? Do you think that that would be appropriate? And I would throw in one more kind of related to this, which is talking about how to um, look at the impact of climate change or damages based on gender rather than location. Who would like to start? So I think that's open to Reed, Sandy, Tema, any of you can begin. Um, I could take a step. So um, on the definition of, of local, I think that um, depends on what you're interested in. So um, in the, the results that I was showing you, we've divided the world into these approximately 25,000 regions for a variety of reasons. That was the scale that we chose. But I think um, I didn't have time to go into this. I think one of the areas where the climate inequality literature really needs to keep up with the air pollution literature is these um, individual leveraging individual level data to characterize much finer resolution variations. So someone asked about gender, you know, there's really exciting work using census level data in the United States to look at differential exposure and vulnerability to air pollution based on things like gender and race and class. And right now, the climate literature is at a much more aggregated level. So most of our studies are some administrative level, whereas I think the more we could start working with individual level data, I think we have a lot more we can do to characterize those types of, of differences. There are definitely some papers on gender. Just really quickly, I'll say things like um, um, you know, infant mortality and infant, um, actually Reed has papers on this that he can talk to, uh, speak to, but um, both of sort of drought events, heat events, and storm events, it tends to, there tends to be a literature showing that um, younger girls are more affected than boys, um, largely for reasons that we think of, of differential investment in boys versus girls. But um, there's definitely some work there. I think there's a lot more that, that can be done. I'll let somebody else take the other ones. Um, I can jump in with um, answering the question on looking at damages depending on the level of uh, economic development or main driver for, uh, for survival. I think absolutely. I, I think that there is a rich um, empirical literature looking at damage functions for different types of industry as you brought up in your example. Um, so you can think of, I think there are papers looking at sort of the impacts of like drought or 
um, air pollution on like farm workers' health or um, workers in the construction industry. So absolutely, I think that that's one way to um, sort of refine your damage function more. I think in um, Tamar's paper, they look at different vulnerabilities based on age as well. So I think there are many different socioeconomic or occupational factors that could affect your vulnerability. So yeah, it's, it's definitely appropriate. And I, I think that if you are interested in this, I would encourage um, research on that. Great. Uh Rita, unless you have anything you want to add, I think we we touched on those pretty well. Um, do any of the live participants have any questions that they would like to ask? Not, then uh, there's two more methodology related questions um, in the Q&A box. The first is around, um, let me see, what is, the uh, a rough idea on the kind of time series data that this person should use and what kind of model would best serve the purpose. Um, they're looking at time series analysis from secondary data. Um, and then there's a second question about if there's a best methodology for calculating adaptation costs. We'll go there. Reed, do you want to take time series? You know, I need more information to answer that question. Actually, I read it and it's it's thinking about it, but it, it's a little bit unclear to me exactly how to respond. Um, That's all right. Maybe do you want to just share a little bit on time series data in general? Um, well, anything that might be helpful, and if they are able to add in more detail, then we can circle back. Yeah, I, uh, hard for me to know. I mean, I could speculate on time series, but I don't think that's a, a useful um, use of our time at this point. Because there are some other questions that I think we could probably answer. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay, there's another question here. Um, I would like to know if there's any data on adaptation costs nas nationally and climate change. What is the expected adaptation based on countries? Um, I can attempt to take that. So I would say, um, thinking about adaptation costs, there's sort of two ways people have tried to tackle that problem. And, and you can think about sometimes the word compensatory investments is also used in other areas outside climate change. Like Reed has work on this. A lot of people think about this in air pollution too. People are spending money and time and energy avoiding air pollution as well. So the idea of adaptation costs is pertinent to many different environmental damages, not just climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's probably fair to say there's two ways of sort of thinking about characterizing, quantifying those. One is to try to enumerate what those adaptive actions are likely going to be, measure how people are taking those actions in history, and then try to value them. Like Reed talked a lot about valuation. So for example, you could look at um, spending on medications, if you think there's a specific medication that people like um, inhalers or something for asthma, if you can actually measure the expenditures on an outcome that you think is directly coming through adaptation, that's sort of like an enumerative approach to quantifying how people are adapting and then trying to value that adaptation. Um, when it comes to things like uh, your whole climate is changing into the future, it can be difficult to take that type of enumerative approach and think that you're getting a comprehensive picture of adaptation costs. So as the climate warms, you know, I might change my working patterns a little bit. I may also have, you know, buy an air conditioner. Um, I might move. There's many different things I can do. And so um, we've, uh, there's been a, a group of papers that have tried to think about more revealed preference approaches to adaptation, basically looking at how populations that are differentially adapted today look different in terms of their vulnerability, and then assuming a sort of simplified model of how that uh, is likely reflecting rational behavior. So maybe to make this um, a little bit more concrete, the idea is like, uh, when we see a heat wave over 100 degrees um, hitting a place like Seattle, which is like a cold, relatively wealthy region in the United States, we see a lot of deaths happen um, on that day. 
because that's a population that's not ready for that event and a lot of a lot of people um uh die whereas that same event in like Houston is sort of a normal summer day and we don't see elevated death risk and so the idea is to to back out what we think adaptation costs may be for a place like Seattle to become a place like Houston we say well in Seattle it hasn't been worth it for them to invest in air conditioning so it must be that the costs of that air conditioning are too expensive for them to invest in it today in Houston, it's definitely worth it. We're seeing that they're not they're not um, responding in terms of their elevated mortality risk on that day. So we're going to write down a model where we assume that it the benefits are more than the costs in Houston, but the benefits are not more than the costs in Seattle. And we can use that type of assumption to back out what's called a revealed preference estimate of adaptation costs. That relies on a lot of simplifying assumptions, and I think there's a lot more work to be done to try to improve estimates based. Um, based on revealed preference, as opposed to that more direct enumerative um, approach. Sorry, that was longer winded than I intended. No, that was great. Thank you. Um, Sandy or Reed, do you have anything to add? No, I thought that was great. Yeah, I agree with everything to him. So. Great. Um, uh, can I just bring in this question from, uh, who is it? Sugat. Bajrachar, and there's some other things like this, I guess for both of you, that if you look at Tama's graph of where the mortality damages are greatest in the world, they're kind of a, a, a band through Africa and South Asia. So that, that, that correlates pretty strongly with subsistence agriculture or you know, casual work. So do you see a sense in which um, kind of read on the, on the kind of US history side and then Tama on where these people might, you know, is, I guess the question is sort of, is there an advantage, if you're getting out of agriculture, is there an advantage to go to say services rather than manufacturing um, because of less exposure to pollution or less emissions? And is there any evidence of that kind of being better you know, in terms of a development model? Because obviously a lot of countries in South Asia and Africa are considering a more service-based, but when we consider the externalities and the damages do you see any value in sort of tilting towards services as opposed to manufacturing yeah i mean chemist closer to the frontier here but i mean i think that the one key way that people that it's kind of seems like the structural winner in terms of avoiding um, some of the harmful aspects of global climate change as it relates to temperatures is is air conditioning you know um, it's not the end all be all, there have been studies of labor productivity for workers that work yeah. indoors that are also air conditioning, um, for which, you know, very hot days still affect their productivity. But, um, you know, to the extent that services and working in the service sector is correlated with an ability, mm -hmm. a workplace that is um, climate controlled relative to a workplace that is not climate controlled that's certainly going to uh to help um, but that is a tall order when in many parts of these of the world we don't have access to reliable grid level electricity that can power an air conditioner for example yeah yeah i, I agree i think the only thing i would two things i would add um one existing empirical evidence suggests that um, while manufacturing may be more affected by ser more affected than services in poor economies, I just like Reed said, it's really about like what does manufacturing look like. Yeah. So in Ishan Nath's um, food problem paper, I think his manufacturing estimates are basically flat. There's like no productivity effects of temperature in the developed world, but there are substantial effects in manufacturing in in poor countries. So I think it's really about like what does that manufacturing sector look like. Um, and then the other point, I think it is more an air pollution point, but I think there's um, Mushvik has a paper and then I think there's a, a, a job market paper um, this year thinking about the importance of mobility, internal mobility in um, informing the aggregate income effects of pollution control in developing countries. The idea basically being that there are these massive productivity gaps between rural and urban areas. And so as we pursue um, uh pollution control, allowing for people to reallocate can dramatically increase the aggregate productivity gains from that pollution control relative to a scenario, say, in India, where maybe you traditionally would have restricted movement more. So I think there's some really interesting um, 
development meets uh, environment questions about mobility, facilitating aggregate gains to environmental policy um, through these uh, urban rural productivity gaps. Thanks a lot. Great. And I saw that Reed helped clarify uh, the question that we touched on earlier. So I think unless there's any more questions that we're, we'll wrap up and uh, give a huge thanks to Tama and Reed and Sandy for uh, helping out with our, our Q&A today. Just as a general reminder, um, the IGC is having a call for proposals right now uh, that closes in two weeks or so. And so if you are interested in applying, uh, you can find more information in the link in the chat. And um, if nothing else, then we'll talk to you next week, same time uh, for our penultimate lecture. So thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Reed. Thanks, Tama. Thank you. Sandy. Bye.